Okay, uh, welcome to uh, most of what we're seeing, about all of what we're seeing today is ancient Egyptian art. And I can't think of a more interesting subject that almost everybody knows about King Tut's tomb, maybe some of the facts, but you're gonna hear some of the myths too. Uh, the bo uh, bottom line is whether or not, you know, some of the commonly held misconceptions about the Great Pyramids or, or King Tut's tomb are accurate or based on fact or just myths. So we'll, we'll cover some of that. And then at the end, if time permits, if not, then next Monday, I'll show you about 15, 20 minutes tops of my own slides of my visit to Egypt, which include uh, the Valley of the Kings, where Tut's tomb is, Cairo, and the Great Pyramids up close. Okay, so let's get started with our first must know slide. And that is the Great Pyramids. So first we'll get rid of this and then get full screen and make sure you guys can see this. Everybody see this? Yes? <laughs> mm, yep. Thank you, it's helpful. Whoa, whoa, it likes jumping boy, that is. Okay, here we go. Let's get back to the one I wanted to start with. You see, I have multiple views because obviously there's different angles and different lighting and times of the day when the Great Pyramids look different. Okay, so here we go. The first must know is just that. Great, two words, pyramids, of course, plural. Egypt, everyone knows how to spell that, uh, I assume. And the date, 2600 to 600 BC. Well, let's start with what does that date really mean? Welcome, we're just starting. We're just on the first slide for today, the Great Pyramids. Okay, 2600, 2600 BC or BCE. That just means that that's the average or median, sorry, and that's the median age of these three pyramids. Each, these are the facts now about the most. I'll say them slowly. The Great Pyramids each took 20 years, about 20 years to build. Okay, you probably know some of these facts, but if you don't, you should be writing this. And, and why were they built? As monuments and tombs, both monuments and tombs to three successive pharaohs. There's no other way to put it. Three successive pharaohs. You know, three generations, obviously, in a row of father, son, and grandson. If you look at it that way, literally, they were blood relatives and they were from the Old Kingdom. We did talk about that on uh, Monday, so you should already have that information. You know, the, the first phase of ancient Egyptian uh, history when they had their first empire, uh, well, they called it kingdom, it was called just like the words Old Kingdom, well, capital O, capital K. That means the period when uh, the ancient Egyptians were uh, beginning to develop their culture that we are studying now. And when Flat-sided pyramids were invented, and that's what we're looking at, one of the uh, earliest inventions of ancient Egyptians. That list of things invented by the ancient Egyptians, I'm not gonna give you separate standalone definitions, uh, except for um, obelisk. Well, actually, yeah, that's on the list. If you saw it Monday, we talked about it, but I, I don't wanna take the time to go back and define, we already have fresco, you have that definition from the first day of class, you remember. Uh, the Egyptians were the first ones to use frescoes, columns to support our buildings, you know, temples mostly, and temples. The idea of permanent buildings for religious services, that's an Egyptian concept. I already said flat-sided pyramids, obelisk, and then written language, there's a debate on that one. And we'll talk a little more about that, but we kind of touched on it with the Babylonians' use of uh, law codes with Hammurabi, right? The stele of Hammurabi. It's, it's hard to prove which of these two cultures uh, came first in terms of using written language. Okay, so so now, welcome, we're just starting on the Great Pyramids. So let's say the other facts about the Great Pyramids besides why they were built, which, which is what I just mentioned. And so, well, if they were tombs, and I think most of you know this, but if not, you should write it, they were only briefly uh, safe deposits for the bodies. And of course, they were the mummified bodies. So you could just say mummies of the dead pharaohs. Both the bodies are mummies and all their worldly possessions that were uh, entombed, that's the right word, entombed, because these are tombs as well as monuments to each of those pharaohs that had them built. They were built during the pharaoh's lifetime. So they got to see their monument that they, that where their body was going to be while they were 
uh, on the throne, right? Um, anyway, the point is once that happened, no more than at most a hundred years, some people say maybe a little more after the pyramids, each one was finished, they were robbed, picked clean, however you want to word that, completely cleaned out. There's nothing inside them except the burial chambers. And I've been inside one. I'll tell you what that's like when we get to my own slides, if we have time today or, or Monday. But best for now to say there were burial chambers in the middle of each of these three great pyramids where both the bodies, or you could say mummies, of each pharaoh and all their worldly possessions, that is their, their you know, movable, obviously not their palaces, but all their movable uh, items. Uh, were, were buried inside those great chambers and sealed, but then they were all robbed, every one of them, within a few decades after they were built. Okay, those are facts most people already know. Now, let's take another look. And I think this, in a way, it, it's a better slide, but it's so up close that I don't think you can tell this setting with the context. It might not be obvious. So on the midterm, if these, uh, by the way, should, should be obvious, but I didn't say. I'm not cutting this uh, topic or this uh, entry. You can call it what you want, slide, these slides, only one of which would be shown, and that would be this one. This is my own slide. I took this slide. This was when I was there in, in Egypt many, many years ago. And the time of day, the lighting is pretty good. So if it's on the exam, you'll have this view because it's almost completely sets all three pyramids in context, of course. Uh, okay, so what we have now are three tombs, which also were monuments for each of those same pharaohs. And then when they were, uh, of course, entombed inside with their possessions, they were robbed. I'm re re rephrasing what we just said for the two or three people that joined late. But there's a lot more to say about the Great Pyramids. One of the facts that is a, not a fact, one of the myths about the Great Pyramids is one I'm going to now clarify or correct, I'll say. Does anybody know who built the Great Pyramids? Anybody? Or what have you heard? Let's just say that. What have, what have you heard from any of your classes or whatever reading you may have done? Like slaves have built Who's them? Built? That's the myth, and it couldn't be more wrong. No, slaves didn't set a single hand in any part of this process, unless you count way down the Nile, hundreds of miles where the stones were cut, the rock quarries where they came from. You could say that definitely that was slave labor, but no part of the construction, the fact that most people don't know, so you should be writing it if you don't already, because it could come up on the test. Um, no part of the construction process was in any way handled by slaves. They were paid laborers with their own union. Yep, they had a union. They didn't call it that, of course. It was some kind of a trade organization where they got the right to negotiate for their wages. They had paid holidays. They had housing provided. It was an honor to work on the Great Pyramids because you were working for the Pharaoh who was considered a minor god. I think most people know that, but if not, again, you should write that. The pyramids were built to honor not just Pharaohs, but the minor gods that those Pharaohs were considered to be. They were considered minor gods on earth. And so you would be you know, only a skilled laborer or well, actually they had to have teamsters, just like we think of today, teamsters without the trucks, of course. They had wheels, they had carts, they had fulcrums, they had levers, they had scaffolding of course we don't know exactly how they did all of this but we do know that uh, there was skilled labor and unskilled labor all of which was paid no slaves touched any part of the pyramids that's just a myth that i think hollywood is keeps repeating that's <laughs> not at all correct we have records from when they were built the egyptians get very thorough records and we also know that the other pyramids after all there are thousands of pyramids scattered all over egypt that were built by ancient egyptians that at least the more important ones for the ruling class were always built by paid laborers, skilled or unskilled, but they were. Okay, people signing in and out. Try, try to stay in with us so it doesn't disrupt the lecture so much, if, if you can, please. All right, because there's a lot to say. That's only one myth. Uh, another myth, I think, might be um, about uh, what happens uh, when Napoleon and Alexander the Great, I, that's in the reverse order, the first of the two conquerors from outside Egypt to take Egypt by you know, conquest was, was Alexander the Great. 
And then later, Napoleon did that too, right? Thousands of years later. Both of them went inside the Great Pyramid. So now let's go see. I think I have a closer view. Well, that one seems good. Nope, that's not it. Let's get back to, here we go. The Great Pyramid is the one on the farthest, and I have much closer views of it. Um, this is an old slide, but, which I bought when I was there. So let's just do it this way. There we go. The Great Pyramid is the tallest of the three. And I think it is a better view. Th this, well, just for the Great Pyramid. Once again, just to be clear, hear me now, remember later, if it's on the test, that's the slide you'll have to look at while you write your analysis, okay? Because you can see more detail. But just for the purpose of explaining, the Great Pyramid was the one that almost, you could just say it as several conquerors, you know, conquerors, right? Egypt's been conquered a bunch of times. And of course, now it's, it's a pretty independent country. So when they were conquered, many of these conquerors, when Egypt was, was occupied, would uh, certainly the two most famous, would be Alexander the Great and Napoleon. They both went inside the Great Pyramid. They both came out looking like ghosts. Or some say like they'd seen a ghost because supposedly they saw their future. Now, is that a myth? I don't know. It wasn't there. The eyewitnesses might have been biased because they were their own soldiers. And when they heard their, their commanders tell them, I just saw my future, well, both of them died. Not very happy deaths, if you don't know, both Alexander the Great and Napoleon. So, so that is that a myth? We don't know. <laughs> we, we don't know for sure. But one fact that isn't in, in dispute is that the Great Pyramids, let's go to the main view of them again, where you can see them more clearly and stay on that view. Uh, the, all three of these together, you know, the, the plural term, what we're looking at, the Great Pyramids, plural, are one of only two man-made objects that can be seen from outer space. Anybody know what the other one is? I bet one or two of you have heard. It's, it's not uh, a great, great wall of China. China. Exactly. But yes. You got it. The Great Wall of China can be seen from, from 100 miles in space. The astronauts have told us that. Russian, American, Chinese astronauts have been able to prove that. Okay, so it's pretty impressive, isn't it? Now, when I say man-made mountains, I'm not being, you know, uh, selective here in any way. There weren't women working on the Great Pyramids. That, and many ancient cultures, women did do some of the actual construction, but not in uh, ancient Egypt. So these are what, man-made mountains? Well, what does that mean? Let's talk about the largest, the Great Pyramid. This is all part of the meaning still. It could be these facts I'm about to give you or specifically related to the largest of the three pyramids. This is called the Pyramid of Khufu, and that's an easy word to spell. I'll, I'll say it slowly. Capital K-H-U-F-U, -U, just like it sounds, Khufu. That was his Arabic name. By the way, were the Egyptians Arabs? Yes and no. <laughs> Modern Arabs speak Arabic and the vast majority are, are Muslim. Neither of those two things apply to the ancient Egyptians. They had their own language and they had, there was no Islam or Christianity back then, of course. So they, had, they were the forerunners. They're called pre-Arabic, the Egyptians in the ancient world. They're called pre-Arabic today. So those, those uh, the Great Pyramid, I'm sorry here, when they were built by these skilled laborers or paid laborers, you just want to say it that way, um, they were deliberately trying to make this the biggest structure or man-made structure on earth. And it remained so. This is one of the facts about it that we'll finish up the meaning with. That the largest, the Pyramid of Khufu, I already spelled for you. Anybody need to respell that? Khufu, okay. The, the Pyramid of Khufu, which is the largest, and it's uh, just called the Great Pyramid, period, because it is the biggest was 480 feet tall when it was new. You can see it's missing the top. So it's now 460 feet. So it's missing the top 20 feet. Either way, 480 or 460 feet makes it the tallest man-made object on earth for centuries. In fact, for thousands of years. The first structure to be taller than this, well, it's in another continent. <laughs> north of Africa, and it's a world famous landmark. People who go to that city always want to go into and up into, anybody know what I'm talking about? The Eiffel Tower, okay, just write it. It was the first structure to be taller than this anywhere on earth. And that's in the late 1800s. Look how long that's almost 4,500 years that this structure, the Pyramid of Khufu, the Great Pyramid 
was the tallest man-made structure on earth. That's pretty amazing. Another fact is that it was also the heaviest because it has um, 2.3 million. You could say nearly two and a half if you round up on the roundup, uh, but yeah, two and a third, if, if you prefer to write that way, million blocks of stone. Each block of stone weighs two to four tons. Everyone knows what a ton is, right? To do the math, 2,000 times four times 2.3 million. I don't think any calculator can add that up. You have to have a laptop. Uh, you know, it, it's, it's a massive structure. It's the heaviest structure, and it was. I mean, oh, sorry, there may be something heavier now, but I can't think of it. But it was the heaviest structure and the tallest both on Earth for thousands of years. Okay, and then one other fact about it is that um, it had a covering of limestone over the stones that we see now. Let's go back to the general view. So the limestone still exists only on the top of the middle pyramid. We'll talk about who had that built in a minute when we get to the next slide, the great Sphinx. So all of them had that smooth covering over the outside. And then it was painted white. So it's the last fact about the meaning you'd want. Painted white, blinding white with some uh, hieroglyphics. Maybe, I don't know, we don't know for sure. Maybe the name of the dead Pharaoh in Egyptian hieroglyphics or maybe some message or some you know symbol for the gods that that Pharaoh was protected by. We don't know. Some kind of religious symbolism was painted usually near the top but the rest of the exterior, all four sides of these pyramids uh, was uh, all done with uh, white covered on it in, in limestone and then painted white. So, you know, first the stone, then the limestone, then the plaster, and then the whitewash. And then, so they had to keep redoing the, the whitewash or white paint every several years, probably, because of course, in the desert, it would wear off. They could be seen from 75 miles away. That's the last fact I'll mention on the meeting. 75 miles away. So there, it's flat there. There's no mountains in this part, except these man-made mountains. Okay, that's plenty on the meaning. The formal analysis, each one is balanced, like all pyramids are by definition left to right, but obviously unbalanced or weighted toward the bottom. They're both stable dynamic. Each row of stones, right, is, and each individual stone is completely stable. The sides are dynamic. For space, the real space, uh, this one, the tallest one was 480 feet when it was new. Uh, the one in the middle was about 280 feet. And the smallest one was only around 140 feet. I'm rounding off it within 10 feet or so each way, except for the Great Pyramid. That one, I have the exact measurements on that one, uh, currently 460 feet. So there are different sizes, but there's no technique for space. Remember, architecture is real space, except that there is a large barrel chamber with a tunnel obviously leading to it inside each of these structures. Color is a warm sand color, literally the color of the desert. Um, and then we have the modeling is just the shadows created by the sun. The lines, there's no carved line here. There once was painted line, but there isn't now, so you would have to mention that doesn't show up in this slide, so you just say that there is no uh, carved or painted line on the exterior, but there is the visual line. Remember, we talked about this with the nine elements. All architecture has visual lines. I mean, every build, unless it's a totally round building, <laughs> there might be a few buildings like that somewhere in the world, but when it has corners or edges, a building always has visual lines at the edges. Okay, um, the rhythm is of course obvious. Each one is the same basic shape and each stone is the same. And the textures are the real rough texture of stone. Okay, moving on, the next must know. This is another one I won't cut from the study list. The Great Sphinx, again, just two words. Sphinx is S-P-H-I-N-X. Great Sphinx. Of course, Egypt, uh, all the slides today are Egypt 2570, 2570 BC or BCE. This we know the exact date of. We don't have to guess when it was completed or, or, or around the date. It, it is already rounded off, right? So if it's on the exam, you could just, you, you already have a date rounded to a zero, uh, but it's on your syllabus anyway. And you remember, it's an open book test, an open note. So this is the Pyramid of Khafre, K H A F R E. That's an important detail. It's the middle pyramid. 
right? Of the three, the Sphinx would be off the edge of this slide, right? Uh, if you could see it, it would be far to the far uh, right. So why is it closest to the pyramid in the middle? Well, there are two theories. One is that it is a sculpture depicting that Pharaoh, Capre. And again, I'll spell that capital K-H-A-F-R-E. He was the son of Khufu. So wouldn't it make sense that they would do a portrait of him uh, when, if they built a statue nearest to his pyramid? Yes and no, because there's no evidence to prove that. And why would only one of these three important pharaohs have built a sphinx and the other two just pass up the opportunity to glorify their memory that way? Each one would have wanted their own sphinx. That's what many historians believe I do too. <clears throat> so if it's not the portrait of Khafre, whose pyramid it stands or sits, I should say crouches, the great sphinx is crouching, that, that is crouching nearest. If it's not a portrait of him, who, who could it be? Nobody and everybody, <laughs> all the pharaohs. That's the leading theory. So I'll say it in a single sentence. The uh, second theory about the uh, meaning of this uh, sphinx is that it's just a general symbol for the power and majesty of all pharaohs. That makes a whole lot more sense to many historians. Because obviously if uh, all the pharaohs could share in the glory of their sphinx guarding their tomb, right? It looks like it's a lion, half human, half lion. That's what sphinx is, the head of a human, the body of a lion, that's to be obvious. And that's an Egyptian mythological creature, of course. If that's the goal is to guard all three, then it makes sense it was placed in the middle, you know, so we could, you know, perhaps keep evil spirits away from all three tombs. Or grave robbers, though that didn't work very well, did it? The other facts about it that you should write now is that this was the largest sculpture of a living creature, human or animal. I'll say it again, the largest sculpture of a living creature ever carved in the ancient world. Some of you will say, wait a minute, the Colossus of Rhodes was 105 feet, if you know your history. We're not gonna talk about that at John Silvis, but it's true, that was a very tall human figure. This is a crouching figure, 165 feet long. That's part of the meaning as well. And of course, it will be part of the formal uh, elements when you do the space. Okay, so once again, it's 165 feet long. If it were to stand on its hind legs, it would be way taller than the Colossus of Rhodes or any other statue. So once again, it was the largest statue of any kind of living creature ever built in the ancient world. It's 65 feet tall and 165 feet long. Okay, but that doesn't tell us how it was built. It was cut out of the living rock of the desert. There's no other way to describe it. This isn't a bunch of stones brought here. Now, these are new stones built to restore it because it's badly deteriorated over the centuries. But if you take a look at this view, actually, in some ways, this might be a better view to show. Although, because of the lighting, you can't see the face that well. Um, okay, <laughs> before we finish and leave to the next slide, I'll tell you which of these two slides would, would be if it's on the midterm, the one you'd see. But you see the pause here. This is, this is a newer slide. This is after it's been restored. You see, that's the level of the desert. It was cut out of, it was a hill that went up like this, you know, and that was all made out of sandstone, that hill. So they just chipped away the living rock of the desert itself to create this image. And that is why it is not like any other sculpture that you may have heard of in the ancient world. It was not constructed, it was carved out of the living rock. That's the only phrase to describe the process. But it has been restored with pieces of stone brought there in recent times. Okay, and then we have the fact that it's wearing, of course, the Pharaoh's headdress and uh, the face could be almost, we don't know what Khafre looked like. His mummy's gone, so we don't know what his face looked like. But I'll tell you one thing before we, we do the formal analysis. Um, the, here's a myth, another one that I'm going to dispel. Anybody know how the nose, it's missing, of course, of the great Sphinx uh, went missing? What happened to it? Anybody heard the story? Well, 
Okay. You haven't heard the myth that either Napoleon's soldier shot it off with a cannon. He would have had them probably executed. He admired ancient Egypt and he saw himself as a modern day Pharaoh among other things. Even some of his fashion choices were <laughs> inspired by ancient Egypt after he'd been there, you know, he conquered it and then left. So no, no, it, the, the nose was missing centuries before Napoleon arrived. His soldiers even commented on how, why is it gone? There is one theory that the Turks who didn't respect any of the cultures they occupied, we're talking about the ancient, well, medieval Turks, okay, in the middle ages, they occupied Egypt. They could have shot the nose off. They had the first cannons in the ancient world, but we don't know that either. It's much more likely it was just the weather, just, you know, time. The desert is pretty harsh, but nobody knows why then. But we know it wasn't shot off by Napoleon's cannon or soldiers, however, and probably not even by the Turks. Okay, so um, I think when we look at this, you can see the detail better, but it's better lit. So I'm going to go with this slide. If it's now, let's go with this one. I tell you what, because you have to do the form elements, but with a close up. So let's do that right now. Balanced. Oh, obviously completely symmetrical as would any intact body of an animal be. But of course, by now you guys should be able to do a lot of these, you know, in your own head as you see each slide. And of course you are gonna be doing them on, uh, this way on your papers if you wanna complete, you know, your formal elements, all nine elements. So it's of course unbalanced toward the bottom, but completely symmetrical left to right. The rhythm is obvious with the paws, and the eyes, the ears, the headdress, uh, even the legs. Now that's where this slide is actually slightly better, but it's kind of poorly lit on the face. So I'm gonna still stay with this. All right, the color is sandstone. It's a very warm color that by definition, it's an earth dome, of course, sand's part of the earth. So it's warm, there's nothing cool. The, the similar texture is only on the head, on the headdress and the face. Uh, now, but originally you would have seen it on the paws. It's still visible a little bit down here. So there is some similar texture and that's done with carved line. There's no painted line. Okay, and then we have um, for space. Well, I just gave you those dimensions. I'll repeat them. It's real space. And that's a 65 foot tall uh, sculpture that's 165 feet long. It's solid. Some people think there's a treasury inside or some kind of you know secret chamber. No, there never was. It's solid, so it's a single mass. There's no larger or smaller masses. Uh, the texture I mentioned simulate. Oh, modeling. The shadows from the sun, of course, create a modeling on, mostly on the face. Uh, and in this photo, you can't see it much anywhere else. But of course, at certain times of the day, there's also shadows on the paws, like here. Okay, I think we covered everything balance. Oh, stable versus dynamic, yeah. It's mostly stable. The body is lying parallel to the ground. The head is upright, very straight. Okay, I'm gonna give you a little quick side view here of, this is my own slide, you don't have to take any notes. And it's not more than 30 or 60 seconds. This is in the basement of the Louvre. If you ever go there, ask to go to the basement. It's not like, a, <laughs> Peewee's big adventure where there is no basement in the, in the Alamo. There is a basement and it's huge. It's as much space in, below the museum floor as above, almost. This is in the basement of the Louvre. It's a huge sphinx made out of very fancy stone, much harder stone than sandstone. Look at the face and the headdress. You see the similarity. Of course, all sphinxes, most historians now agree, the majority of, of historians, that, that they were just general images of uh, pharaohs overall to glorify the pharaoh as a, a concept, you know, as a, uh, you know, presence who they believed was descended from gods and therefore a mind of God on earth. It's huge, by the way, this one is 30 feet long and 15 feet high. Quick tip, best food court ever is in the basement of the loop. You got food from all over the world and it's all good. <laughs> unless they closed it because of the pandemic. Last time I was there, it was very popular. So half of the basement is a food court and the other half is where the things there are no display upstairs are. You have to get permission to put on. Okay, and here's a fact about the ancient Egypt. So I'll keep it brief because we want to get all the other must know slides in. And we'll probably go to about 418 because we started at 303, but I don't want to go late, okay. 
this is uh, it's not my stuff, but it's uh, in a museum in the Cairo Museum. <laughs> Accurate skin tones. How could it be? The guy, uh, the husband, is Prince Rahotep. You don't have to know these people. I'm just telling you who they are. And his wife, the queen, of course, no, the princess. They weren't yet king and queen. They were going to become the pharaoh and his wife. So Prince Rahotep and his wife, Princess Nofret, I love that. <laughs> she never worried, right? N-O-F-R-E-T. Okay, why I'm showing it to you is to make a point about ancient Egypt that most people don't even think about. I would consider them to be many, just say many historians, and it would be the first truly multicultural society on Earth, or at least the first one we have records of. They weren't hung up about ethnic background, race, appearance. Why does the woman have white looking skin? That's not her natural skin tones. Her skin tones have been the same as her husband's probably. We don't know for sure because we don't have other images of her. Because upper class women would often put a thick makeup of pancake white makeup over their skin, at least their exposed you know, face and, and hands. Uh, when they went out in the sun, or even if they were, you know, just in public, because a two reasons: one, it was a sign of their wealth and, and, and supposedly beautiful beauty, but more importantly, it protected their skin from sun damage, and that's not a minor consideration. They didn't have any kind of store-bought sunscreen, so so upper-class women often would do that, and it wasn't about what you know their real appearance would have been without it. But the point I'm making is that if you look at Egyptian uh, artifacts all the way back to the old kingdom, all the way up until Cleopatra, who was a mixed race, you may know, part European, part pre-Arabic, right? About each equally uh, descended from Alexander the Great and the earlier pharaohs. They were just not hung up. The ancient Egyptians had, they had African sub-Saharan, black African rulers for uh, several generations in, on the thrones of the pharaohs in Egypt. And they were accepted. And King Tut, we're going to see that in just the last one or two slides, clearly had more sub-Saharan Black African genetic background than uh, lighter skin Arabic, let alone uh, anything you know like a European heritage, which of course wasn't present in Egypt this far back. So bottom line, the Egyptians didn't care how you looked. It wasn't an issue to them. They were very open-minded about uh, appearances and ethnic backgrounds. Okay, the next must know is this one. We'll just stick with this slide because it's the most famous view. This is another one I'm not cutting from the uh, study list. Okay, here we go. Bust of Nefertiti. N-E-F-E-R-T-I-T-I. -E -T -T -I. Bust of Nefertiti. Egypt, of course, 1348 BC. There's a lot to say about her, so I'll just hit the highlights, but let's start with she's one of only, get this, three, three women in the entire history of ancient Egypt who had real power. She was a co-ruler, though not sole ruler, co-ruler, with her husband, Amenhotep. Just spell it like it sounds, but I guess I'll say A-M-E-N-H-O-T-E-P. Amenhotep and her were co-rulers. Each one had equal power and responsibility in running the uh, Egyptian empire. And this was during the, um, Middle Kingdom period, when they reached the very high level of power, they had conquered some of their neighboring kingdoms and things. So she had a lot of power. There was only two others in the whole history of ancient Egypt, 3,000 years, do the math, three women, that's once every thousand years. Of course, it didn't work out that way mathematically, but only three out of 3,000 years. So of course it was a patriarchal society in that sense. Uh, well, in every sense, uh, but, she had such a uh, magnetism, right? I don't know the word, you know, charisma, I guess you could say, uh, that people respected her. She was very, very intelligent, well-educated, spoke, spoke multiple languages and was popular with the masses until she and her husband made a big, I would underline that word, mistake. <laughs> they decided to get rid of all the old religions and reinsert their own new religion, the religion of Ra, that's just capital R-A, uh, the name of the God they thought should be the only God people would worship, the sun God, Ra. That didn't go over very well, as you can imagine, with the masses. In fact, it caused a rebellion. Eventually, they were overthrown. 
by a, a rebellion, a popular rebellion. But of course, that was stirred up by people who wanted to take over the throne, take it away from them. So it was like a coup that succeeded, unlike the one in January 6th. Uh, so what you have is a woman with power who would have had every much as a bit, I mean, as much responsibility and importance, respect, however you want to word that, as her husband. And during their reign, it lasted nearly 20 years until toward the end when they switched to this one God religion. They were quite popular, but she was more popular than he was from all records. No one knows what happened to her. After that rebellion, she disappeared. She could have been killed, maybe torn apart by the mob, but there's no record of that. She could have disguised herself and slipped away in the night. She had three children, I think, or just a few children. Anyway, I think it was three. They also disappeared. So she could have disguised herself and gone to a neighboring kingdom. She could have blended in with the crowd, but with a face like this, probably would have been hard to hide her identity. No one knows, no, no remnants of her, no record of her. And certainly, obviously not her mummy. People keep thinking, I think we found her mummy. No, that turned out to be someone else because we have some DNA evidence to go on because of all the other mummies we have of her ancestors. So nobody knows what happened to her. It's a mystery of history is the way I like to say it. Okay, but what we do know is what the idiots that stole this piece did to it. If it's not obvious, it's been damaged. It was discovered intact in a, an artist studio and you might as well know his name, Tutmos, T-U-T-M-O-S. He admired her. Some, some people think he had a crush on her. In any case, she chose him to be her official royal portrait maker. Of course, they weren't doing paintings then very often anyway of pharaohs. Well, when they died, they did. They were doing sculpture. So, so this is a life-size from a life mask uh, bust, of course, head and neck of her with her crown done from life when she was at the height of her power. It was discovered intact. And the last fact about the meaning is the tragic event that happened to it. When it was discovered in the early 1900s by German, I'll call them thieves, what else were they, archeologists, they stole it. Even back then there were laws about that. They secretly took it out of Egypt, put it on a boat. And then when it was shipped to Berlin, that's where it is now, you have to go to Berlin to see it in a museum in Berlin. Some idiot dropped the case that they had carried it all that way and damaged it, broke both ears and knocked out one of the eyeballs. That's why it looks this way. It was found intact. If it weren't for those, well, idiots is the word I'd use that stole it, it would still be intact. But it's still impressive, even though it's condition. Okay, so let's do the formal analysis because uh, those are all the main facts about the meaning. Boy, is this balanced or is it? Because to me, if you look at the headdress from the side, but you're only gonna have this view if it's on the test, you can see it's kind of weighted toward the top, isn't it? Because of the wide headdress. So if you wanna write that, you can. And even in this picture, there's some hint of the way it goes up like that. Um, yeah, and then we have for mass, it's, I would say it's three masses. Her headdress is the largest mass. And then her, head and neck and then her necklace, if you want to break it down like that. Now for space, there's one technique, of course, overlapping the headdress over the forehead, the necklace over uh, obviously her, her neck and shoulders. Uh, and then the, the line is both painted and carved. It's clearly painted on her eyes and eyebrows and uh, even to some degree around the edges of her lips. Uh, but it's also carved, the lips themselves, the, the actual eyeballs, the ears. The necklace, the headdress, has, they have carved lining. Colors, it's neutral. That's actually, uh, it looks almost bluish, but it's really a kind of a black, uh, very dark, dark blue in the black. So we'll say it's basically neutral black on the headdress. And of course, then you have the decorations uh, across the band or along the band. And those are, you guys know by now, right? Red's warm, green is cool, and gold is warm. So it's a mixture. The same thing with her uh, face is, is, well, it's it's neutral black eyelining and, you know, makeup, if you want to say it that way, around the eyebrows. And then warm, obviously, skin tones and uh, lips and a mixture of warm and cool on the uh, necklace. Simia texture, it's superb. It really is very... Uh, accurate, lifelike, however you want to say that, realistic on everything, the skin, the jewelry, the headdress. 
Um, and let's see, the rhythm is obvious with the two eyes, with left with the two ears, the necklace and so forth. And the modeling is just the shadows from the museum. Uh, okay, and I said it was balanced roughly. Um, um, left to right and unbalanced toward the top. Okay, now this next must know is one that I'm not saying it's so important, it absolutely won't be cut from the study of this. I try to make sure you know which ones that applies to and which one doesn't, but it, it, it's still, as I say, any must know slide I show you from the syllabus could be on the midterm. So this is the next must know. It's the Temple of Hot Shit Soup. Now that's a hard name to say or pronounce, so I'll say it twice or spell it twice. Hot Shit Soup, Temple of H, her, her name was H A T S H E. P S U T. Again, H A T S H E P S U T. Pronounced hot shit soup. Someone told me it sounded in one of my classes like a Greek restaurant menu item, but uh, that's the name of a woman. Rare, rare example of a sole female ruler. She was a pharaoh all on her own with no partner. She wasn't married and she ruled for 20 years. It's rather remarkable really rare in ancient Egypt. The date 1348 BC. So this is in the Middle Kingdom. And what we see here, there are two theories. One is it's just a temple dedicated to her either during her lifetime or after she died. But if it's the latter, or it could be being built while she's alive and then of course dedicated to her after she died, it could also have been her tomb because her uh, Rain was the, what I already said this, but if you don't uh, have it in your notes, you should add this. She's only one of three female rulers in ancient Egyptian history. We already covered the last one was uh, Nefertiti, the previous slide, I should say. The last one to rule was Cleopatra, of course, and then this woman, that's it. So she wasn't well respected by her rivals, the male upper class, right, ruling class, members of her extended family, some of them wanted to depose her, right? To overthrow her, they didn't succeed. But when she died, this is an important detail, her memory was erased from all the records of ancient Egypt, but we found this temple or tomb, I think it's both. The theories are it's either one or both. And so we know it was at least used as a temple to worship her because there are sculptures of her on every about every eighth column. There's giant, larger than life size, 15 foot tall images of her while she was there well, with her headdress. It's very rare. It's in the Valley of the Queens, which is right uh, across the mountain. On the other side of the same mountain range is the Valley of the Kings. And that is where King Tut's tomb is. So these two uh, valleys are on opposite sides of the same mountain ridge. It's really not a range that felt like it was huge. It was just, you know, several hundred foot tall ridge of mountains. One side facing the Nile, the side faces the Nile is where her tomb is. Oh, sorry, temple that might also have been a tomb. And on the other side were the tombs, actual tombs of all the pharaohs from that part of the Middle Kingdom period of ancient Egypt. Okay, the only other thing to say about it is we, we again, we don't know what happened to her body because maybe it was never stored here. It was in perhaps a separate tomb somewhere off in the mountainside, something, but no evidence has been found of that you know points in the direction of what happened to her body. As she would have been mummified, clearly that's part of their religion, and probably somehow you know, entombed somewhere with her worldly possessions. So this is at least we know a monument to her because she was a very popular ruler. The last fact about the meaning, I'll say this slowly, is that she was one of the most popular rulers of the Middle Kingdom because she cared about the conditions, or you could say the plight uh, of the, you know, the living conditions of the poor and working class. She actually did some things to help improve some of, like the people that worked on this temple while she was still alive, it was being built, we know that. Uh, she had them paid better and given better working conditions than most laborers in ancient Egypt. So she was quite popular during her reign. One reason she was never overthrown ruled for 20 years, and that was a long time in the ancient world. Okay, formal analysis. It's completely symmetrical left to right, but what's missing from here, and you can only barely see the tip of it in my own slides, I will show you 
this is a pretty old slide, it's not my own, uh, a third level, and it grows up to about here. Can you see where that's cut from the living rock? The whole thing, just like the Sphinx, was cut out of the mountainside, not with stone brought there. Okay, so it had three levels originally, and therefore it's obviously unbalanced toward the bottom, uh, but definitely uh, balanced symmetrically left to right. The rhythm is obvious with these columns, and they, there you see one of the or a couple of those statues. The, the space is real space. It's very simple. I'll say it slowly. Three different levels. You only see two of the three here, but originally all three uh, were first level was 20 foot high. One long open room. I'll say it again. Sorry. One long open room on the ground floor with 20 foot high ceilings. This is the real space. The second level had another long open room with 15 foot high ceilings. And the third level, another long open room with about 12 foot high ceilings. So uh, that's all real space, of course. Uh, then there's the shadows creating the, the, the sun on that side, creating deep shadows. So that's how the modeling is done naturally by sunlight. The lines were carved on the statue, but you can't see them in this slide. So you wouldn't have to write about that. Maybe you could just sort of tell there, but you could just say there are visual lines around the columns and the corners. The texture, the real uh, rough texture of sandstone, and the color, of course, is smooth. Uh, and the rhythm is the repeated shapes of the columns and the statues on some of the columns. Hi, sorry, can you slow down just a little bit? I'm having some trouble keeping yeah. up and I'm writing really fast. You know what? It's good timing. I just said to myself, no, that's a lot. Let me go back. Yeah, thank you. How far back uh, you want me to summarize this? I mean, maybe just the last part that you were just saying. I'm sure. just trying, trying to keep up. Absolutely. Thank you. Actually, it's yeah. very thank helpful you. both for me to do my job better. And no, I, I welcome that kind of input. All maybe right. from, from the columns, maybe. Yeah, sure, thank, sure. Thank you. Well, how about the whole formal analysis? You want me to do that? that? That way everyone makes sure they have it. Okay, we'll start with the fact that it has, uh, let's do the space first, because that's what you meant, I think, by the columns. Uh, there were three levels. I know this slide, I mean, it's the one that's in the textbook files. <laughs> I don't know why it doesn't have the third level, because I've been there, it's there. So just say originally, we go say it slowly. This had three levels. So the space was one, described like this, one long open room. I think you can see there are no walls, right? One long open room on the ground floor with 20 foot high ceilings. The second level, another long open room with 15 foot high ceilings. And the third level that you don't see here, but is original. Again, another long open room with about 12 foot high ceilings, okay? Then the rhythm is the, just two things. The columns, of course, repeat, and the sculpture on some of her statues. You can say statues of her. There were more, by the way. Well, actually, you can see about three of them. No, there we go. See, they're about every eighth column. So repeated shapes of, of statues of, of uh, the queen and, and the columns. That's the rhythm. It's entirely stable. I don't think I said that. So it's a good thing you caught me on that. I'm not going to rush ahead, but I would have been overlooking an important detail. There's nothing dynamic about this. Every angle, every part of it is straight. Now, if you talked about the top of the headdress, but you can't see that from this slide, from this picture, uh, just the Pharaoh's headdress would be stable, but even her body is, uh, I mean, dynamic, I'm sorry. Everything else is stable. So just say it's, it's a stable work with no curved or diagonal lines. For masses, it should be obvious, the largest mass, but I'll make sure that's clear in your notes would be the ground floor. This is not part of the temple. That was added later by the Greeks. So the ground floor was the largest mass, and you can guess the second largest was the middle floor, and then the third floor, which is not visible here. Actually, they were already restoring it, but you just can't see it from this angle. Uh, the third floor was the third largest mass. All right, and the shadows from the sun create modeling. And the line, there is not, in this photo, you can't see carved lines. It's just the uh, visual, remember that word visual with an S, visual lines that are created by the corners or edges of each column, right? And that's not carved or painted line. And the color is a warm sandstone. 
And the texture is the real rough texture of stone. You can't really see the cement textures on the uh, queen's face here. You will in my own slides when we get to them, which we may not get to till Monday. Okay, we got that. Now that's important. I'm glad you got that. Here's another view of it being restored, but that's so so incomplete that I wouldn't use the slide on the exam. It was on the internet. It's been worked on for decades. They found it in ruins buried under rubble. The British, I think, in the 1930s or 40s even, and then it was slowly being restored. Okay, this is the next must know. Oh, we do. We're doing pretty well on time. This is the pylon of Ramses II. Ramses II, Roman numeral two. But if you wrote the number two, I'd still give you credit. But it's what's on. So this, of course, is the way you should write. It. So again, pylon, that's P Y L O N of Ramesses. Some people pronounce it that way because there's an E in the middle. R, of course, capital R A M E S E S. Pylon of Ramesses II at Amun. That's A M U N. That's the title. Pylon of Ramesses II at Amun. Location, of course, Egypt, 1280 BC. So he was a ruler of the New Kingdom, and he ruled Ramses, or if you prefer to say it, Ramesses, as some people do. Uh, he was one of the early New Kingdom rulers. And he ruled longer than any other Egyptian pharaoh for over 65, I think it was 67, to say over 65 years, or nearly 70, you could say it that way. That's why he was on the throne. That's not how long he lived. That's remarkable that he stayed in power that long. And he was famous for building huge monuments like this temple complex. This is one end of a temple complex, and I'll say this twice, that runs for a mile along the Nile. It's not just corny rhyming, uh, it's the fact. This temple complex at Karnak, the temple was dedicated to the god Amun, who is the protector of the pharaohs. I'll say it again, the name Amun is the protector god of all pharaohs. So he, Ramses, built this temple in the honor of his god, his protector. But it's at a place, it's still there, still standing, called Karnak. And the complex is a bunch of different temples that you know he had built over well 70 years almost he was a ruler many decades it was under construction that whole complex of temples runs for a mile along the Nile quite literally that's just about the actual size of it but what is also important in this one is that that's an obelisk so we only have two new definitions to wrap up uh, this topic. An obelisk, now this is on your handout, so I'm not gonna spell that. It's below the six things invented by ancient Egyptians. So it's a short definition. Uh, an obelisk is a tall, narrow piece of stone carved with important scenes from that culture's history. Again, a tall, narrow piece of stone carved with important scenes from that culture's history. Are there obelisks anywhere in the world besides Egypt? They invented them. Can anybody think of any? Well, probably not unless you've been to Europe. Yeah, they're, they're in Rome. Some of them are actually Egyptian obelisks stolen. In London, Paris, Madrid. <laughs> Many of those were stolen from Egypt, but some of them are modern ones. But anybody think of the most famous obelisk? It's in this country. It's the biggest obelisk ever built. Every time you see the news from this city, you almost always see if it shows the skyline. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Nobody? <laughs> the Washington Monument. <laughs> that's the biggest obelisk ever created. Now, that's the exception. They didn't carve it with zinc because nobody could agree on what they should or shouldn't put on the outside of that one. But you don't have to have seen whatever Spider-Man movie it was or one of the more recent ones to see you know, when they go climb up. to No, it's the tallest obelisk, way far. So this one is, is 60 feet, and we'll get to the dimensions in a moment, but let's finish up the meaning. Why are, is the entrance so narrow? Anybody guess why they would have, to a major temple, which the king, i.e. Pharaoh, could, could bring his private family you know, for private worship, or even on his own, maybe with just some bodyguards. Why would they keep the entrance so narrow? Because there were walls and a ceiling that completely surrounded this entire temple, and they're all falling. Into ruin. Well, okay, it's getting late. Two 
protect the site to control access for security, whatever words or phrase you want to use. There's no question this was very carefully planned. There were nutcases in the ancient world, just like there are today, that want to destroy and kill other people because they're unhappy about something. So yes, there were attempted assassinations and things like that, terrorist incidents in the ancient world. So in order to protect this temple and everyone inside worshiping, including the priests that actually lived there, as well as any visitors, they had, look how narrow it is, a very, very limited access. So only one person or maybe two side by side at a time could even get in. And then of course you could guess what these windows were for. Lookouts who would then say, see the guy in the whatever, you know, headdress uh, over in that side of the crowd with a red scarf, whatever, grab it, right? If they thought they saw somebody uh, who was dangerous coming towards the entrance. So they had 24 seven security in other words. <laughs> So this guy survived to old age, died in his sleep, I think. And he was called Ramses the Great. He's the one that the, the Red Sea supposedly, but that's the major myth, obviously. He didn't die in the sea or any, or his soldiers didn't obviously, the parting of the Red Sea, that's pretty obviously not a fact. But uh, that's the story is based on him, that actual fear, the one that the Jewish slaves were able to, uh, to, to, to get their freedom from. I need to keep moving, we're kind of running late here. Okay, so his other title was Ramsey the Builder. Okay, formal analysis, I'm gonna do this quickly because we gotta to get to King Tut. This is the uh, texture of real rough stone, no cement texture here, but on the sculptures, 20 foot high sculptures of his, his right face on the flower, his body, and that, that has carved line to create simulated texture. The rest of the lines are visual. This should start to be familiar to you guys by now, but anyway, I'll do them, of course, on each each slide that's might be on the exam. Okay, what have we got? Balance, oh, completely symmetrical, of course, but they get wider as they go to the bottom. These are pylons, by the way, each one. So they are unbalanced toward the bottom. <clears throat> and then the modeling, of course, is just the shadows from the sun. Uh, it is uh, both stable and dynamic. I mean, the, the obelisk and the statues are stable, the pylons, or, or uh, diagonals lines. Of course, that makes those both dynamic. For space, the 50 foot high pylons, and I'll repeat this once, 60 foot high obelisk and 20 foot high statues. I've been there, I spent a whole day there. It's an amazing place. Again, 50 foot high pylons, 60 foot high obelisk, 20 foot high um, statues. Okay. I think I already mentioned the rhythm, the sculpture, and each piece of stone, of course. Um, I think I've got that balance, rhythm, texture. Right. And the color is, of course, warm. Okay, we are going to do King Tut now. And uh, funerary is our last definition. It's a short definition. Funerary. Uh, something having to do with funerals. Something having to do with funerals. Okay, funerary. It's pretty self-explanatory. This is a funerary piece of art. Of course, we're talking about anything relating to the funeral of anybody. This is uh, the last, second to last month. No, I think it is just the throne of Tutankhamun. T, oh boy, you guys just have it in front of you. Okay, so let's just, it's, I'll spell it once. T-U-T-A-N-K. H-A-M-U-N. Again, the syllabus should be right there in front of you as we go through so we don't have to get bogged down in some of these five syllable names that we'll never get through the semester. Egypt, of course, uh, and the date is 1329 BC. I think most of you know these facts, so I'm going to keep them brief. If, if, if you need me to repeat anything, let me know, but then I will explode a couple of myths about him. First, he was called the boy king because he took the throne at 17 and he died before he was 20, meaning he ruled for less than three years. So his, one of his uh, titles was the boy king. Another is that he was married to a childhood sweetheart. Yes, it was an arranged marriage. All royal marriages are arranged marriages, almost. Well, not today, but in the ancient world. But that's his wife there. And they genuinely loved each other in every sense of the word. The evidence is overwhelming. Uh, we won't see my slides until Monday of the inside of King Tut's tomb. But you'll see when I show you my slides of the two of them 
she didn't just anoint him with oil, he did it for her. And it's on the walls of his tomb. So we don't have to guess, unless the records are there. They really loved and respected each other. But don't make the mistake if this one is, slide is on the um, midterm of saying they were co-rulers. No, no, not, not at all. She didn't have any power. She had influence, of course, as his wife. So there they are, a loving couple, arranged marriages, sweethearts since they were children. You could say childhood sweethearts. And uh, she was respected by him. And uh, they did, you know, nice things. They say things for each other that uh, married couples, when they really, really like each other, would do. And that's what you see happening here. He's on his throne and she's anointing with oil. So this is the throne found inside his tomb. And if you don't know this, then you should write it. King Tut's, that's a short way to say it, right? King Tut's tomb was the only Pharaoh's tomb found intact in modern times. I mean, that's pretty easy. I think everybody knows that, right? The only one. No other Pharaoh's tomb has ever been found in modern times. Intact. Just the bare walls, you know? This had everything. It had his mummy. It had the artwork. It had his throne. It had his chariot. <laughs> Uh, it, it just was full of, of rich treasures. And the guy that found it was a British archaeologist who, to this day, is honored and admired in Egypt. He's a hero because he's the only one I can think of that didn't take everything out of Egypt. He insisted that all those objects be kept in Egypt, which is where they are today. Okay, so he was unusual. His name was Lord Carter. You don't have to know his name for the exam, but he's someone I greatly admire. I mean, you know what? 100 years ago, exactly 100 years ago, the tomb was found in 1922. And it was an international expedition, and he gave equal importance and influence to the Egyptian and Arab and other uh, non Western archaeologists. He didn't just, you know, act like a colonial, right? Because Egypt was a colony at that time of the British Empire. He could have done whatever he wanted, but he didn't act that way. He had respect for the local population. Okay, so that's pretty much the whole meaning here, except that they're wearing their ceremonial headdresses. Look at that. And there's the throne that we're looking at the back of. That's an image within an image, of course. So formal analysis, they are balanced because look at the height of their headdresses and the tops of their heads. The largest mass would be him if he stood up, of course, because he was taller than her, than her, than the throne. Color, that's real gold is warm on their skin tones and the background, cool on their clothing and their headdresses, right? Cool kind of blue and uh, little sort of off-white light, silvery blue on, on the robes. And then we have Simia texture, superb, done with carved line and, and uh, painted both on the headdress, on their skin, on their necklaces, on their clothing, everywhere super sharp realistic in their texture. Now the modeling is from the museum lighting now, but of course it's a bow relief panel, so you would have seen the modeling in the sunlight uh, or torchlight if you were visiting the tomb before it was sealed up. It's stable, look carefully. His body's almost entirely at a right angle. The throne is at a right angle. She's standing upright. Their headdresses and the, of course tops of their heads, and there's some detail like necklaces, th those are uh, dynamic. Uh, let's see, are we forgetting anything? Balance, rhythm, space, the only techniques for space. This is about one quarter life size. These figures just say that they're about uh, 15 inches high or 16 inches, something like that. They're, they're less than a quarter, smaller than life size, that's good enough. But there is overlapping, of course, of their headdresses and clothing over their bodies. Okay, the last slide is maybe the most important one not cutting this from a study list. Funerary, I already spelled that word, mask of Tutankhamun, right? Egypt, 1327 BC. We know he died under mysterious circumstances. So the last thing to say about him, and I don't need to rush this because we're doing okay on the time. I don't want to rush this. Some of you know this. There's a, there's a, a legend that supposedly the people who discovered King Tut's tomb, uh, many of those explorers or you got to call them archaeologists died mysterious death you know or violent unnatural deaths poppycock bullpucky whatever word you want to use <laughs> because that's just there were over 120 of them and they were of all different ages and the ones that died one of them was a, a daredevil motorcycle rider back in england okay he died of a crash within five years big surprise right another one died of an infection when he was shaving 
but it was in the um, tropics and people got infections. They still do, but much more easily. And there was no antibiotics back then, right? <laughs> Let alone cures for a serious infection. So, okay, so one of the guys who was middle-aged accidentally got infected and died, I think a couple of years or maybe a year later. There's not really any evidence for a curse, but that was the story that was told at the time when these people started having obituaries you know, in their local newspapers. Oh, he was on that exploration that found Todd's tomb. Maybe it was a curse, yeah, pretty silly. Another thing about him that I think most people don't realize is that uh, his wife was at least, if not more popular than he was, but he and she together were a very popular couple. And I'm building up to a question here, which is if you know American history going back to, let's say the middle of the last century, think about all the rulers we've had, think how, who this might apply to. Very popular, youngest ruler they ever had, married to a woman who spoke multiple languages, who was at least as popular as him, they got adoring crowds where they even they were only in you know on the throne for three years right that's it that's not very long that's another clue who i'm referring or comparing him to and then of course he died under mysterious circumstances and i'll just expel or not expel i'll just put out there three possible causes one is an accident he was club-footed he had polio when he was a kid and he could have just slipped and fall and hit his head you know, obviously you could die that way um, that's a possible thing, an accidental fall. Another is um, malaria. That did kill people and not just the lower classes. And uh, still does, but in the ancient world, even more common uh, was death by, by uh, tropical disease, malaria or something like that. And then the third is foul play. The evidence for that, I'll repeat this slowly, there is some evidence. There was a hole in the back of his skull when the mummy was found. No one knows, now that's a mystery, how it got there. It could have been from a fall. It could have been foul play, a blow to the head. Or it could just have been a mistake made during the mummification process by a careless mummifier. But you know what? If you were that careless and you were working on the Pharaoh's body, your life was toast. I mean, <laughs> you'd have to be really, really stupid and careless if you were gonna you know, punch a hole in the back of the Pharaoh's head while you're mummified. I, I don't buy that one. So it could even have been possibly foul play, but I, most historians think it was some kind of a, an accident. We don't know. There's no evidence for it except for one last fact, and then we'll do a form analysis, which is about what we know about it, that his throne was taken over by uh, one of his advisors they didn't have vice presidents back then. I'm giving you another clue who I'm comparing him to in modern American history. And so that guy not only coveted the throne and wanted to take it away from Tut, but he forced Tut's widow to marry him. Now, that's not a parallel with the person I'm thinking. Anybody think of any American president that might fit some of those uh, descriptions? No. <laughs> My daughter just said Teddy Rosa. No, no, no. Much more recent than that. Nobody think. That's a young guy, very popular. Hey, can I guess? Who? Can I guess? Yes, please do. That's what I mean. Uh, John F. Kennedy? Yes, they say that in Egypt. I'm not making that money. I wouldn't have thought that until I went to Egypt and I heard people say, he was our Kennedy. He was popular. His wife was very beloved and they spoke multiple languages well, he didn't John Kennedy only spoke English but uh, Jackie Kennedy spoke like five languages and yes they both died under mysterious circumstances we don't have to guess that Kennedy didn't die in an accident obviously but other than that we can say that there are a lot of parallels the youngest rulers in the history of each of those cultures yeah they, that's the one excellent you got that so that's just what some people in Egypt consider a parallel. That's all you can say in some other historians. All right, let's wrap it up with the uh, formal analysis and then we're gonna end pretty much right on time, but I'll stick around because I, I don't, don't have time for my own slides today, but we'll be able to do them on Monday and it'll just be about 15 minutes or so at the end of the Monday lecture. Well, let me just see on Monday, uh, we have Greek. Yeah, we'll do a Monday, not, not, not Wednesday because we'll be able to do the Aegean art first and that'll leave us time because there's only four or five slides of that. All right, let's do the formal elements. Um, well, we have the fact that it is completely balanced left to right. And I would say this photo makes it look balanced top to bottom because this is the, the uh, wooden carved image, life-size image 
it's a mask, right? Placed over the mummy, right? And then the mummy itself was placed with this headdress in a coffin. And then the coffin was placed in a sarcophagus, which is what they found in the tomb. So you see this giant stone box, you lift that, was a, 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 I'll show it to you, it's still sitting there. The sarcophagus is now empty, of course, it, it, mummies in Cairo. But they lifted the stone lid off. Then they found the coffin. Then they had to cut open the wooden coffin. Then they took the mask off very carefully. It didn't damage it. These people cared about what they were doing, unlike those Germans that stole Nefertiti's bus. And then they found the mummy wrapped, of course. So it's like four layers to preserve and protect the body of the king. Why? Because they believed pharaohs had to be their bodies. I mean, it had to be protected. So when they got to the next life, to the other underworld, they call it, we, we don't mean the criminal meaning of it now, but the underworld was the afterlife. We just say afterlife. That the Egyptian religion taught that when a pharaoh went to the afterlife, their body had to be intact so that they could enjoy heaven or paradise, the, their version of heaven. And so they, that's why they preserve the body so carefully. Okay, so it, it's balanced, left to right and top to bottom, mostly stable, real carefully. The top of his headdress is curved, that's true. And, and then we have the uh, snakes here, right? Actually, we have a um, vulture-headed snake and a cobra, two of the animals that Pharaoh could change into. Remember, we covered that on Monday. The Egyptian religion taught that Pharaohs are minor gods, but also they could change themselves into certain kinds of animals, such as cobras, uh, falcons, uh, vultures. You'll see those images on the walls of his tomb when I show you my own slides. And then the colors, cool on the blue, that's called lapis lazuli. You don't have to know that word. I used it put it in the syllabus, or I mean, in the list of terrorists, but you don't have to know it. It's a precious stone. The Egyptians loved using a blue stone. That's cool, of course. And then the eyebrows and eyelids are black and the eyeballs are black and white. Ivory, of course, if it's not obvious, it's ivory. And that would be neutral. And then everything else is gold, all of his skin tones, and that's warm. The beard's fake, by the way. He didn't, he was too young. He never did grow a beard. He didn't have enough time or else he just didn't have the right genes. So they had to put a fake beard on his mummy and on this mask. Um, the line is inlaid, carved, you could say, because that's what inlay is, right? Carved into the wood and also for the headdress. And then um, there is some painted line around the eyebrows and the eyes. It is a very, very, um, what's the word obvious to me it, it's a quick aside that he was of sub-saharan or black african mixed black african heritage we know his mother was sub-saharan black african so that's almost a dead certainty but the images here clearly indicate someone who had uh, a mixed heritage we get someone on here so let's wrap it up with the last what are we missing oh modeling is just the shadows that the museum lighting creates and uh, then we have her mask. The largest mass is the headdress, then the face, then the beard. Uh, and for space, it's a life-size hollow, right, mask, uh, which has overlapping the headdress and the beard over the chin. And let's see, I think I already mentioned carved line, right, and the color, okay, I think, oh, texture. The cement texture is, is superb. That's one of the things it's most famous for. Even the way the beards were back then, they were always tightly wrapped. The real beards that a real older pharaoh who had a real beard would have. Stay would have been buried along with, of course, the, the mummy, taken off when they mummified and then put back on. <clears throat> so just say the cement texture on everything is sharp and realistic. The beard, even though <laughs> the beard is fake, the skin, the eyes, and the headdress, and even the two uh, snake heads. Okay, we got to where we were supposed to be. So I'm gonna hit stop share and stick around for a few minutes if there are any questions anybody has. But anything we covered, we covered a lot, I know, but you can count on at least one, maybe two of these slides being on the midterm. And we'll talk about how to study for the midterm review. That's several weeks away, but your papers are due March 7th. So you've got three weeks. And I would hope that you uh, have thought of what you, topic you wanna to write about. Okay, and if you do, you can send me if you choose to, a draft of the paper, as long as it's not the day before it's due, but at least 48 hours before, hopefully sooner than that, for me to give you some feedback if you want, as a PDF, of course. But make sure you say, this is not my final paper. If you don't, it's not clear to me. Are you submitting it early? Okay, I'll grade it. And then 
you know, whoops, I did. You need to clarify if you choose to use the option of me giving you a, my a critique in advance, then it gives you a chance to make any changes if you choose to do that for, uh, you know, increasing your, your grade. Okay, any questions? Let me do the... Wait, well, when's the paper due again? March 7th. Three weeks uh, from, I think it's three weeks from Wednesday. Let me see, March 7th. Um, yeah, I don't have a calendar in front of me. I just, it's March 7th. Yeah, it is a Monday. Yeah, yeah. That gives me more time to get, you know, started grading that week. Now, I won't get them graded in a week. Give, give me two weeks. It'll probably be less, but it, it might take that long. Because I'll have two other classes, of course, to, to, to grade at the same time. Any other questions now about what we covered, ancient Egyptian art, or about grades or extra credit? Now it's time to do that. And uh, these are my unofficial office hours, as you all know. Um, okay, I appreciate your comments and, as always, your participation. And and like the, whoever it was, thank you again. I didn't catch the name of the, of, the, of one of your fellow students who asked me to repeat something, and and at least on that slide, slow, slowed down the uh, narrative. And I need occasionally to have reminders. I mean, I welcome those. So don't hesitate if that occurs to you that I might need to either say something slower or repeat it at any point in any class, in any lecture, uh, I, I uh, welcome that. It makes it better for everybody to make sure they get a clear set of notes and understanding the meaning of it and the composition of each slide. So, okay, let's see one more time. I'll ask one more time. Any other questions anybody has before we sign off? No questions. Okay, thank you guys for your participation. Have a good weekend. Well, not quite yet. A good remainder of the week. Okay. Have a nice weekend. Thank, thank you. you as well. Thank you. Hope you're healing well. Thank you. Yes, much better. Thank you.